Listen, said Isaiah. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. This is what the Lord says. In the time of my favour I will answer you and in the time of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people. Shout for joy, O heavens. Rejoice, O earth. Burst into song, O mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. Welcome to our morning service at St Mary with St Martin, particularly those of you who are joining us online. We pray that you will feel very much part and parcel of, uh, of the worship here and that you'll be able to worship in your own hearts, in your own living room. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We've come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. So we sing of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is and what he's done, as we sing at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow.
Please be seated. As we come to worship our Almighty God and our Heavenly Father, we need to come in repentance and humility, confessing our weakness and sin to Him. Jesus said, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. We share together in a prayer of confession. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as God's forgiven people, we share together in a joyful prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you most humble and hearty thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and all humankind. We bless you for our creation, preservation and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and the hope of glory. Give us, we pray, such a sense of all your mercies that our hearts may be sincerely thankful so that we may show forth your praise not only with our lips but in our lives and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory for ever and ever. Amen. God has called us together as a church, as a people of, uh, as a people of his family, that we may serve one another as we serve him. So we sing our next hymn, Brother, Sister, Let Me Serve You.
Please be seated. Brian has given me a short introduction to this morning's readings. Our two readings are by the same man, John the disciple who became an apostle of Jesus. We read in his gospel about Thomas, known to us for his doubting, or is it for his honesty? And then we come to John's own testimony of Jesus in his first letter. We read of some of the implications of what he'd seen with his own eyes. So from 1 John chapter 1, we read, We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So now we hear from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, beginning to read at verse 19. Jesus appears to the disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. After he, uh, sorry. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be to you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. 
Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Well, last week we looked at God speaking. <clears throat> and I said that this week we'd look at the question, who's listening? More particularly, we're looking at what actively listening to God means. What responding to what we've heard may mean for us. We live in a changing world. We may feel that what seems familiar and sure is now moving and unsure. Instead of the immovable rock, we feel we're on shifting sands. Technology isn't the only thing, but ideas, lifestyle, moral questions, all we once held dear, built our life upon, they're all up for question, challenge and change. There's a rejection of values held by previous generations. And maybe we've become unsure about what we believe. John and his brother James was one of the first of the inner cabinet of disciples. He was one of the first to follow after his friends, Peter and Andrew. With Peter and James, he saw Jesus transfigured before them. He saw the glory of God in Jesus, the same glory of the burning bush, the same glory of the pillar of cloud and fire, the same glory that filled the newly built temple. And he heard God tell them to listen to his son. He saw Jesus pass the bread at Passover as he sat next to him in the upper room. He heard Jesus commit his mother to his care at the cross. He saw the empty tomb on Easter day with Peter. There he moved from uncertainty to belief and commitment. He saw Jesus among them in the upper room and again the nail prints and wound when Thomas met with the risen Jesus. And again, he saw Jesus ascended and the glory of the Holy Spirit sent among them. No wonder he can write these opening words in his first letter. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked up at and touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we've seen and heard. He shares what he's seen and heard, an amazing testimony. He was after all, witness of all this. It's what made him an apostle, a witness of Jesus' life and resurrection. What made him to be sent to proclaim the good news. He'd seen, he'd listened. He had to respond. This unknown fisherman come businessman on the shores of Galilee was changed by the Holy Spirit into a committed ambassador for Christ because of what he saw and heard. He was a world-changing spokesman for God's new kingdom and a documenter of the teaching of Jesus, especially opening up to us the seven I Am titles of Jesus. I guess he was as certain about Jesus as anyone could be. And in his gospel, he relates Thomas's journey, a very different one. 
He's been much maligned as the doubter. And that doubt has been portrayed down the centuries as something that's bad. But the other disciples also had doubts. The two on the road to Emmaus didn't believe the women who'd been to the tomb. And there was even doubt at the Sea of Galilee several days later. So let's not put Thomas down when we've just, we'd have just been as the same and perhaps less honest than he. But Thomas the doubter became Thomas the proclaimer, the honest one declaring his inability to accept the unacceptable. He became the honest one declaring his total trust in the unavoidable. He became Thomas the believer, Thomas the truster, Thomas the proclaimer. My Lord and my God is his exclamation. And like John, he responded to the call of Jesus to go and make disciples. And tradition has it that he got as far as India with the gospel message. What does it mean to listen? to respond to the voice of Jesus. What do we see in John and Thomas and their journeys of belief? In a few moments, we'll be sharing together with the creed as we respond to uh, what we've heard. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, crucified, died and buried. On the third day, he rose again. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Doesn't it excite you? I found there's no other way to repeat the creed than to lift my voice at the end in joyful anticipation. I believe in the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and a life everlasting. Hallelujah, I hear you cry. Nobody? No. When we say, I believe in God, and so on, What do we mean? What does it mean to listen to God and respond? It seems to me that there are two ways of believing. One is that of the university lecturer, a belief that the world is round, a belief that the economy works this way rather than that, a belief that it's possible to calculate pi to a hundred quadrillion places. They recently got to a hundred trillion decimal places. Fancy spending a life doing that. Some people in and outside the church approach belief like that. It is assent, perhaps informed assent, perhaps from a study of theology or, or of the Bible. But some, and some have every area of the creed explained and can present papers on it. And I tell you, they make me feel very small. But I want to ask, is it essential to give total unwavering assent in all these points, all our lives, to be a Christian? If so, then I'm not a Christian. I have doubts, like Thomas, about all kinds of things. Are we expected to tick all the creedal boxes? Is that what having faith means? Do we assent to these statements and thereby have faith? Is that what makes us a Christian? Well, no. That's not how the Bible talks about faith. Not as assent. But sadly, it's how a lot of the church down the millennia has approached it. Give assent to these propositions and we'll baptise you. Tick these boxes and we'll make you a bishop. This is the way to a powerless, loveless, aimless and inward-looking Christendom. A spiritless orthodoxy. 
And it's not how Jesus wants his church. Because there's a second way of believing. The first was like the university lecturer. The second is almost diametrically opposed to that. Believing like an infant child, just as Jesus said. I believe doesn't mean I assent to what I've heard. Otherwise, we probably also have to go through all the problems of understanding as well. And I tell you now, there's so much I don't understand. But Jesus calls us to no mere ticking of boxes, but to a life of trusting faith, walking with the one we trust and love in a living relationship, even into an unknown way and with all our uncertainties. John wrote, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. John uses a different word in the middle which translations often don't use, mainly because it isn't normal grammatical language. He says, whoever believes on him shall have eternal life. Believe on is the expression John uses, not believe in or assent to. Whatever we assent to or believe in, it may not make a difference. It's as we put our trust on Jesus that life is changed. It's the difference between assenting that your chair will have the strength to hold you and letting it take your weight as you rest in it. Let's look at Thomas. Initially, he couldn't assent to the idea that Jesus was alive. When he saw this was true, however, he didn't simply move to tick some more boxes, but he moved to the avowed love, trust and commitment to Jesus as Lord and God, his Lord and God. John followed his introduction to his letter, not with assent, but to having fellowship with him, walking with him in the light, he says. That's the experience of forgiveness and turning from sin. Our lives undergoing a change and a new direction. Not simply our minds moving to a different point of view. He describes it as being born again of the Spirit of God. When Jesus speaks, he isn't just sharing a new idea or even a new lifestyle. He said to Peter, follow me. He told Nicodemus to be born again of the Spirit. And like them, we're called into a relationship with Jesus, not into a philosophy class. He is the new idea. Listening means following him. So how does that affect our uncertainties? What about doubt, challenges that we face? If there are two different ways of believing, perhaps there are two different ways of doubting when we face challenges to our beliefs. Professor Stephen Hawking changed his mind. He had doubts about at least one of his theories and he changed his mind. I imagine it was a big step for him but I'm not sure it was so earth-shattering. He was able to write a new book for a start. That's what happens when we face challenges to what we are sent to. But challenge to trust is like an earthquake. People say that when they experience an earthquake or a tsunami, it doesn't only destroy people, houses and possessions, it destroys our confidence in anything. Everything that was so sure for their whole life now becomes unsure. And a death 
especially of someone close, can be such an earthquake. Everything, including the uncertainties and even our faith in God, can be unseated in the process. That's real doubt. The intellectual doubt about items in the creed, uncertainties and questions, isn't doubt at all by comparison. We just untick some boxes for a while. However, life's earthquakes shake the trust we put in God, not just our ideas about God. And that's when he holds us. When you've been in a disaster of an earthquake, you need someone to pull you out. And that's what he does. When Jesus called Thomas to stop doubting and to believe, he isn't saying you must have all the boxes ticked. He's saying, whatever your doubts, put your trust, your life into my hands wholeheartedly and see where that leads. And Thomas was prepared to do that. There'll always be challenges to our faith. Doubts are a universal experience. Even Jesus faced personal challenges about his call, about what God wanted him to do. And when Jesus got to Gethsemane, he had the kind of doubts we're talking about. Was the cross really his destiny? And on the cross, the earthquake hit hardest that God, his father, had deserted him as he bore the sin of the world. He didn't doubt the existence of God, of his father. He called on him. That box was still ticked in ascent, but he was confronted by challenges about their relationship. If Jesus faced those kind of challenges, doubts that shook him to the core and yet never sinned, we have to say that doubt, even the earthquake doubt, is not a sin. Certainly after the earthquake of my late wife's death, my faith came out a very different shape than when I went in. I wonder what's been happening to us in our journey. Have we learned anything? Maybe we've understood something more. Have we learned to believe? Better still, have we learned, have we come to trust? Have we found what it is to be sure in Jesus? And despite doubts which we all have, are we prepared to trust him? even through the earthquake. Dave was a scientist with whom I discuss questions of belief quite regularly. But something he heard hit him where intellectual answers wouldn't touch. And Dave received Jesus as his saviour. He didn't simply say, I assent. He said, in the same way as he'd said at his marriage to Christine, I do. I commit myself. A little later, I asked him, do we need to discuss those issues we talked about before? And he assured me, no. They don't matter anymore. He'd moved from the need to tick boxes to a life-changing trust and relationship with the Saviour. And 40 years later, he's still very much involved in their church, sharing the message of the living Lord Jesus Christ. Have we learned to listen? Have we learned to respond from the heart, not just with our ears, but from the heart, listening with our heart? Let's spend a few moments in silence and prayer. All I once held dear, built my life upon, all this world reveres and wars to own, 
All I once thought gain, I have counted loss, spent and worthless now, compared to this, knowing you, Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. Father, help us to listen and to respond to your gracious and loving call. In Jesus' name, amen. And we sing together. Angel voices ever singing round thy throne of light. you to share in the Apostles' Creed together, not to tick any boxes, but to affirm our trust, our living trust in our living Saviour from our hearts. Following this, uh, the music group will lead us in a song to introduce us into our time of intercessions, which Jenny and uh, Chris will be leading. 
Let's share in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only... Oops, oh, I beg your pardon. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. O oh God, our Father, help us to be still in your presence, that we may know ourselves to be your people and you to be our God. We worship you, O oh Lord, and give thanks to you for your great glory and power. All the things which we enjoy come from you, and we praise you for your generosity in providing for all the blessings of this life. So in the stillness this morning, in the love and fellowship of Jesus Christ, let us bring to you our cares and needs. Gracious Father, we pray for our world. We thank you for all your wonderful creation. We are sorry for the many ways in which we have fallen short in caring for it. We remember before you now the countries that are suffering as a result of war or natural disasters. We pray for the leaders of the nations, that they may have the wisdom to know and the courage to do what is right, to bring about peace and alleviate suffering. We pray for the injured and disabled, the mentally distressed, the homeless and hungry, those who mourn their dead, and especially those who are without hope or friends, to sustain them in their grief. Be with them, Lord, in their suffering. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray for our church of St Mary Magdalene with St Martin. We give thanks for our buildings and all the opportunities for worship and fellowship that take place here. Strengthen and guide Amanda and all those in leadership roles. This morning we give thanks for the service that Tony has given as warden and we ask that you will bless him and Jane as they move to a new home. We pray for our new warden, Sue, and all who serve on the PCC. 
and we uplift before you all who are involved in the day-to-day -day running of the church, those who lead our services and the music, and those who enable online worship, those involved in administration, those who clean and care for the buildings and gardens, those who lead groups, those on the pastoral care team, and those who work with our children and young people. We pray that we may always use our gifts to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray for Amanda and the team leading the Rooted in Jesus conferences in the Congo. We thank you for the conference in Bukavu and we ask your blessing on all who attended as they return to their parishes. We pray for the team as they prepare for the second conference in Uvira beginning on Tuesday. For the participants as they travel, for good teaching and group discussions during the four days, and for safety, good health and energy for all involved. May it be a time of real joy and fellowship. Amen. We pray for our Prime Minister and his government, that they may have the wisdom and knowledge to find solutions to the complex problems in our society, that they may act with integrity and honesty, and that they may work together in unity for the common good. Amen. We pray for our local leaders, our mayor, our councillors, police chiefs, judges, and all who serve our borough. Strengthen them with wisdom and grace for the heavy burdens they carry. May they manage their teams and projects with understanding and compassion. Amen. Healing Lord, we pray for those who are in, ill in hospital or at home. Give them courage, hope and peace and the knowledge that you are present in their weakness, pain and suffering. We thank you for the skills and knowledge of the professionals who care and for the love and support of family members. We bring before you now those in need within our church family and any others on our hearts today. Be with them, Lord, we pray. Amen. We thank you for those who have died in faith, that they were an example of your love here on earth and are now at peace in your heavenly kingdom. We pray that you will comfort all those who have recently lost loved ones and fill them with your peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we dedicate ourselves to God's service this week, we pray, God of faith, deepen our faith so we may bear witness to Christ in the world. God of hope, strengthen our hope so that we may be signposts to your transforming presence. God of love, kindle our love so that in a fragile and divided world, we may be signs of the faith, hope, and love which we share in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Merciful Father, accept Amen. these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we continue in prayer as we share together in the collect. O oh Lord, we beseech you mercifully to hear the prayers of your people who call upon you and grant that they may both perceive and know what things they ought to do and also may have grace and power faithfully to fulfill them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And as our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We sing together a hymn of affirmation. O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Please sit down. A few notices. Uh, one is uh, that uh, you may have noticed that our front garden is in the process of being uh, uh, dug over, of being weeded, but there's an awful lot still needed to be doing. And uh, there'll be a, a garden, garden party, a garden work party this uh, coming Saturday. 23rd of September. Uh, well, next Saturday? Oh, right, okay. 
Sorry, um, it was in the notices that I was uh, given. Okay, yeah, that's uh, down as uh, yesterday. But they're going to do it again. They're going to do it again um, tomorrow, uh, next Saturday, uh, at two o'clock. If anyone feels free to help, they'd be very grateful. Um, Saturday, sun, mm, uh, the uh, next Thursday, I think it is, uh, Cafe Matinee is at two o'clock. Um, at uh, Thursday the 28th of September and they'll be showing uh, Victoria and Abdul a 2017 British historical drama film about the real life relationship between Queen Victoria and her Indian Muslim servant uh, so uh, yeah that's uh, Thursday uh, Sunday the 8th of October there's Messy Church and they will need helpers Saturday, 25th of November, do put in your diary, Christmas Fair, and they'll still need help there. You all have heard that uh, Amanda is in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo with a team now preparing for their second conference, teaching the Rooted in Jesus course. And uh, they've had a few hitches, but by and large, all is going well. Please continue to support them in prayer. Andrew Taylor is still in hospital, but thankfully uh, the news is that it's not a stroke, but acute mobility problems for which he's getting treatment. Do pray for him. It's with uh, a very grateful heart we can announce that to date, the total offerings for our first fruit Sunday is £7,736.13, including the gift aid that's claimed. Thank you so much for your generosity. And further uh, about our giving, uh, you may have uh, noted if you've gone online, we've recently added a new way of giving via the website. Uh, there's a donations page and uh, you can use the QR code, um, particularly of course if you're uh, watching, uh, sharing in the service uh, online, why not uh, go to that page uh, after, after the service is closed and bring your offering to the Lord. We're looking for more volunteers for the tea and coffee rotor uh, for after the 9.30 service, specifically for the first Sunday in the month, as we're now down to just one person. Uh, they're going to be very busy if, um, or not be able to do it if, uh, if they are not joined by others. And there are also a need for new volunteers to make soup when we have soup on various Sundays during the year. We've lost several regulars who were helping. Please speak to Sue Newman if you're able to assist in any way. And finally, as our notices, we want to say thank you to Tony. Tony, come and join me. Tony uh, has come to the end of uh, his work as a warden uh, for the church. And uh, we don't want to let uh, today go unmarked. Uh, Tony, can you tell us first of all? Uh, come to the mic. Um, how long have you been? How long have you been with St Mary's Church? Um, okay, so that's quite a long time. Um, so um, giving giving the ages away, then so it's over sixty years. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but I guess there was there was a little gap of ten years when I um, graduated and then I moved over uh, to Cambly, where I served with one of the previous uh, curates that were here and uh, we worked together for, for, for a time. Right. You've had a number of roles in the church, but how long have you been a warden? So I've just come up to two and a half years, so uh, uh, yeah. Mm. Any particular highlights you can say uh, from this particular role? Well, I think, um, firstly to say, that I think it's a real privilege to be um, a warden, and uh, from Brian saying this morning about your doubts and whether you're good enough, I certainly had those. Um, and putting my trust on him, on our Lord Jesus Christ, um, certainly helped to, to get me through that. But also, I know that I got the support from all of you, you know, uh, both here and in the, in the second service as well. And I thank you for all that, for that time, for, to getting to know you more, more um, um, uh, better, and, and for all the help that you've given. Um, Highlights, well, 
Um, I think there are always things that are going on in the church, and uh, I guess um, the, the, the main thing, I guess, in some ways, was making sure that the, we renewed our toilets and they came to fruition, which was really great. But also, um, I think that one of the things that uh, happens when your church warden is the unexpected. Um, and so a number of highlights there. But I did want to just say thank you to Jane because it's a really difficult um, role mm. because you never know when things are going to happen. Yeah. So highlights are things like there's a flood in the hall and it's gone all the way down the corridor uh, and we need some help now uh, for the preschool where else we can't open. So that's something at 7.30, quarter to 8 in the morning. Uh, during the Jonathan Vieira concert, uh, the toilets were um, <laughs> blocked up, so um, helping Chris to actually solve though that while, while everybody else was enjoying themselves in the second half, we were there frantically trying to get the toilets to work. Um, but I think there are lots of uh, um, you know, nicer highlights than that in terms of having fellowship with people, just spending the, that time with people in the church, but also um, uh, at other churches. Um, when you're church warden, you go to various commissioning. There was a commission session at St Mildred's not so long ago, and you meet a lot of people that actually got exactly the same, if you like, issues as you have, but also the same joys. Uh, and that was really refreshing to know that you can celebrate together. And also uh, met the Archdeacon of Rygate, and um, and she put the humour into the role. So one of the things about the church warden's role as far as she was concerned, is you're the number 10 in rugby. So the number 10 is the one that receives the ball and passes it on to someone else. So that's the, that's the art, is to get, receive that ball, but to pass it as quickly as possible. In reality, that doesn't always happen, and you're st stuck a lot. You're stuck with, with it. <laughs> especially when there are only few of us. So. OK. If you had the chance to preach one sermon uh, at St Mary's, what would you want to communicate? What do you think is the most important thing in, in the Christian message that you'd want to convey? That's, um, that's a really a difficult question. I had to think about it um, when... Uh, I gave when you notice. Did, yeah, I gave me notice on that one. Um, and I, I have written a few little bits and pieces that I will, I will, I will show. Yeah, don't, don't preach the sermon. Just, no, no. just tell us I mean, the highlights. There's, there's three points, and then and three then points. Divided good, into good three sermon. points, and uh, and before you know it, you've done about 18 points, and no one can remember anything. <laughs> so, um, uh, but for me, I think it's actually um, I'm going to give two passages. One, one is Matthew five, which is about salt and light. And about people cleansing themselves, making sure they're um, uh, obedient to God, and then to be light to enable you to communicate with people that may not have the same view as you, or to encourage people, um, and to also care for others, especially the lonely, the needy, uh, the refugee, persecutor, and those that are suffering in war um, and for me that's really in, been important that to be able to uh, be that light you still have to go through that cleansing and be, making sure that at each point uh, during our service we, we forgive our sins and, 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 and ask God to forgive us and I think that's really important that we do that at the, at the beginning and that we, we look to God to really help us through and to help us to encourage us to be that beacon of light. The second one I always wanted to say was about was Galatians 5, which is particularly close to me, which is fruit of the Spirit, and being able to demonstrate them in our lives, and that it's something that, as we grow, that he really gives us a lot of joy. And, and I think that's what I felt being part of the, the congregation here, as we've talked in our life groups over the years, as we've done um, services, as we've done really good uh, celebrations of worship, we are starting to demonstrate, and have demonstrated all those fruits of the Spirit. And, and I've really enjoyed 
that bit, and I receive as much as a gig being part of the music group or in the past being part of the choir. Um, and I really um, uh, appreciated all those, all those opp opportunities, really, to be able to um, praise and thank God um, for the, the gifts that he gives to us. Great. Thank you. Let's pray for Tony thank you. and Jane. Father, we want to thank you for Tony, for his service among us. We want to thank you for all the, the patient work behind the scenes that this has involved. We thank you, Father, for dealing with toilets and dealing with flooding and dealing with, with all the intricacies of people too. Loving Father, put your spirit on Tony as he goes and serves you elsewhere. Bless Jane too, that together they may know your presence in their new roles, in their new places. We thank you, Father, for your servant here, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as a tiny token of our thanks, we want to uh, share, give you um, a rose bush. We hope uh, and pray that uh, as it grows, so your memories of us will grow too. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. God bless. Just to say, I've, I've known Tony for many, many years, pretty much all his life, really. <laughs> and it's been a wonderful joy to have him in our family. Uh, Jane as well. I remember coming to the wedding. Wonderful time. So many happy memories. So I've given him a rose called the Pilgrim. Hope it carries on. Thank you. Called the Pilgrim. Okay, well, let's come to God in prayer as we close our service. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.